Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I'm your host for the day. The purpose of this show is to really capture people's lives and life stories, to celebrate their life, rather than wait till the day comes when we're reading their obituary and wish that we had met them when they were alive. Well, this is your chance to meet them when they're very much alive and vibrant. Um, my belief is everyone has a story to tell, literally everyone. And so um, our purpose is to try bring those stories forward so that we can all appreciate and get to know some very wonderful people. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you have a question for our guest, you can email me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. And I will forward your question to the guest and I'll also um, put you on a list to uh, be interviewed at some point down the road. Well, today I'm honored to have as our guest, Ali Jing. Ali, good to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Gary. Um, this is an interesting program. Thank you. Well, you're more than welcome. Yes. So, Ali, take us back to where it all started, where that, that life started. And and a little bit about your early life and some of your hopes and dreams and story. Wonderful, All right, thank you. So um, where it all started is basically when my father and my mother met, you know, very long time ago. And, um, you know, I heard a lot of stories that my mom used to be a very beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. Many people loved him, right? Uh, but my father was a lucky one who was able to marry him. And my father basically traveled a lot. He studied in uh, Russia, you know, long time ago in the 70s. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, and then uh, when he came back in uh, Mauritania, you know, when he was also also very young um, and uh, he got married to my wife, my wife, my, my mother. And then I was the firstborn as their first firstborn child, right? Uh -huh. I am, uh, I have five brothers and sisters, three sisters and one brother. Um, they are all now grown up and none of them basically leave. Uh, we, we've never been to a house together, but I'll tell you more. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, it's uh, they they were both born in Mauritania. My parents. That my mother is from Boke and my dad from Rosso, right? Rosso, Mauritania. Uh, but also, I grew up in Senegal. You know, and I know Senegal more than Mauritania. You know. Okay. Uh, but um, you know, my father also lived in in Senegal a lot. You know, but back in you know the during the colonization, my grandfather also used to travel a lot. France, he's in Africa, he's in Senegal, he's in Mauritania. So my family is all over the place between those two countries, right? Hmm. Some of my father's brother were born in Senegal, some in Mauritania, and my siblings as well. We are all over the place. So when I was born as a first child, um, you know, and... Um, we were very, very, a very rich family, let's say that. Very, very, you know, we had all the basic needs. And I remember as a kid, um, you know, I used, we used to have, the, on, in the neighborhood, we only used to have like television, for example. People in the neighborhood used to come to our home to watch TV. And we also have DVD, DVD right, back then in the, um, in the 80s. I remember that very well. Um, and, but in one point, you know, my mother got sick, you know, very sick um, and got sick for also for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And I don't even have a lot of memories about my mother, you know, um, but uh, um, and in one point she was she lived with her mother herself because to, to take good care of her. Thank as well. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, you know, my sisters and I and brother, we were split split among extended families to be raised because we were young and our mother was not feeling well. Gotcha. Um, you know, and then when she passed, basically my sisters, we also, they stayed right where, where they were, for example, some of them in Mauritania, some of them in Senegal, but me, I was in Senegal with my grandfather, you know, the father of my father. Um, yeah. He's the one who raised me and uh, uh, 
I was raised basically by the community, let's say that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that really helped me to be resilient, to understand, you know, the quality of, 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 of life. You know? And uh, my father, in one point in 1993, when I was in middle school, he emigrated to France. You know, that's where he still reside right there, um, you know. And, um, you know, throughout life also around the night, uh, my father, when he immigrated, basically, um, I was alone. I felt a lot of, you know, I felt, I felt alone. I was raised by uh, the community. My grandfather was, you know, getting, getting older and, and, and sick. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's how my, my childhood went. But in one point, we were very wealthy and have everything, have a car, have DVD, a, a decent house, right. um, you know, and then in one point, everything shifted, everything changed. you know, and then it all become like a survival mode, let's say. Right. And yes. So, so I think yeah, so um, first of all, I'm sorry of your mom's passing at a young age. How old were you when she passed away? Um, I was like uh, nine, you know. Nine, okay, yeah. 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 Eight, nine, yeah. What did your father and grandfather do for work, Ali? Yeah. So my my grandfather was in the army, you know, and uh, in the 60s until 1957, both Senegal and Mauritania were like colonized by French. You mm -hmm. know, and it was one 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 country. It's in 1957 that they split the two countries, right? Uh -huh. And my grandfather basically. Um, you know, stayed in Senegal to serve there. He was a yeah. captain in the in the army. It's not the army, but it's not, it's not even the police, but the called the gendarmerie. You know, yeah, he was lieutenant. He retired, and then they called him back. And you know, a couple months after, he was made like a captain, and then he retired for for forever. So my father was an agricultural engineer. You know, um, yep, and um, he studied in Russia, and um, he held like great, you know, leadership jobs in in Senegal, for example. And mm -hmm. until 1993, he did a voluntary departure, and he, you know, went to to Europe, and that's where he still reside. He retired now too as well. Okay. Uh, but my mother was just a stay at home mom. That's as much as I remember. He was a stay at home yeah. mom. Yeah. Five yeah. children. She had a lot of. Yes. Children to raise, yes. 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 Are, are your sisters and brother still in Senegal? Yeah, yeah. So one of them is in Mauritania. Actually, she had a baby just yesterday, a oh. second baby. Yep, a baby girl. Yep, in Mauritania. Uh, my brother, the youngest brother, the youngest is in, in Belgium. That's where he lives now. He's married <laughs> there. He has a child as well. My sister is in, that came after me, is in Columbus, Ohio, like right oh. here. Yep. Yeah. So basically right now I have one sister in Senegal, right? right? One sister in Mauritania, one brother in Belgium, and one other sister in Columbus, Ohio, right? Here. My so goodness. Over the place. <laughs> <laughs> the United Nations. Yes. And you know, what, what's so funny is also, even my brothers and sisters, we do not remember all of us being in one, under one roof, Together. Together. Since wow. we were who we are. Wow. We never, because some of them was with my mom. We were just all over the place. Do you, do you think that, is that a goal to have that day come when you can all celebrate together? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it will be just needing of coordination between my brother in Belgium and my sister here to go back. And maybe one of the sister in Senegal or Mauritania will yeah. be somewhere. Yes. yes. Yeah. That would be a wonderful yeah. day. It will be. And also maybe even with our children too. So we all get to exactly. know each other. Exactly. Ali, uh, being the oldest uh, sibling, did that have, um, what culturally, what did that mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. And that's a great question. Yeah, culturally, because if you are the oldest in the family, so you are, you should be the most responsible person mm -hmm. because you have to wear the hat of mother, the hat of father, basically. Mm -hmm. And any important decision about a family, you are the one who have to, like the last word, right? Yep. And you are also expected to take good care of your parents. 
So our mother passed, but our father now is old and, and, and sick, right? So okay. it is my responsibility basically to make sure that he is well cared for. Um, and reason why, you know, until recently, I went back to France to, to see him. And I'm actually planning another trip to go see him. Um, and you are respected. And, you know, your brothers and sisters, your younger brothers and sisters should also respect you. Mm -hmm. and also follow your guidance so basically you are the head of the family that's how culturally it, it, it is for example if they have issues with their marriages you know they are you are the one who you know need to play the mediation yes. around yeah. how to solve the issue you know yep. and um, a lot of expectations for an oldest person you know okay. yeah but at the same time very rewarding if your brothers and sisters basically respect you and uh, yeah. It's an honor to you, for it sure. Is. Yeah. It is, yeah. So uh, when did you come to this country? Yeah, so yes, uh, another story, an interesting story. My wife and I, we met in uh, my home country, Mauritania, you know, and she was a Peace Corps volunteer uh, mm -hmm. in 2000, right? And uh, back then, I believe that I was in high school Right. And um, she was teaching in the middle school, you know, as a as a yep. teacher in the middle school of uh, the Lycée of Rosa. Um, that's how, how we met. And we met because of just my leadership, uh, you know, in, in the community. Basically, you know, I created an English club and used to invite her to come and tell us a little bit about the United States. Uh -huh. There were also a group of Peace Corps volunteers from the United States, from uh, the U.S in Rosso. Um, and I worked with them in a lot of activities that could generate revenue for young people in, in, in my city, right? Mm -hmm. And um, basically that's how I met my wife and we became friends for a very long time and then we fell in love. And then 9-11 came, right? 9-11, yeah. Uh, right. she, yeah, they asked all the uh, Peace Corps volunteers to go back for safety issues because Mauritania is a, uh, is a Muslim country, yep. you know. Yes, we have Arabic people, like the Berber, people who look like Arabic. We also have Black people, you know. Um, but, you know, it's a country of 100% Muslim people. Mm -hmm. But 9-11, it was like associated with, you know, Muslim issues in maybe okay. Afghanistan and stuff. So for safety reason, they asked them to go back, right? So when she went back in the U.S. to go to school, right, I continued my, you know, study, and then went to the capital of Mauritania for, at the University of Mauritania, Nakshat, where I was studying, let's say, public international law, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, and then, you know, upon my studies in 2007, in 2005, she came back, my wife came back, right? And when she came back, basically, we decided to get married. Yeah. So we got married. She came back to the U.S. I stayed there um, to continue my study until 2007. That's when I came um, here in the United States. Okay. And when I came in 2007, my wife was working for an organization called Detention Watch Network. It was just immigration immigrants that are in jail, basically for yeah. paperwork purposes. And then... Um, we lived in Washington, D.C. That's where I landed, right? And I remember January 2007, right? And there, you know, um, you know, was uh, I waited for a little bit to get my papers to be able to work and yes, also to go to school, you know, and then, you know, was going to a call, school called Carlos Rosario to learn about English, to also learn about computer science and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we had a baby in 2008, February 2008, that's when she decided to be closer to her family, my wife's family. They are from the Andirondacks, like right here, two hours oh, yeah. away from New right. York. Yeah, yeah, Chateaugay Lake. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, from there, you know, my wife, because we have a baby, we are in DC, no close right. family. So, um, and she didn't want to also live in upstate New York, but she wanted to live like close to, uh, you know, Burlington, Vermont, because she <laughs> studied here at Middlebury College okay. and then at SIT. 
and she loved nature and we decided to come here in Vermont. So it's close to her family. That's uh, how I ended up in, in the city of Wellington. Wow. And since then, been living here since wow. 2008. Wow. Yeah. We're lucky to have you and your family. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great place. And to tell you the truth, I did not like Burlington when I just got here. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I did not like it. But I visited before, before coming here, you know, and they showed me only Church Street. It was so beautiful, right? right. I'm like, wow, I want to live here, you know. Um, but when we moved and lived on Pine Street, like basically, I mean, and started with my bike, walking around the city, running around. I realized that basically, wow, the city is so like felt like very rural to me, you know, compared to Washington, D.C., even right. where exactly. I grew up, yes, was even more modern. There was no that. But it quickly realized that, you know, the way of life here is completely different because here people care more about the environment, the, the, the purity of the air uh, and recycling and nature and mountains and lakes and um, you know, and what I noticed though first time was just here you can see the sky compared to Washington DC. Yes. You know? And also the friendliness of the people, especially when it's sunny. People were like really friendly and nice when it's sunny. But winter, people were not like that, you know, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. uh, I would think winter and you can the nice thing is I know you work with many new Americans right now that come from uh Africa, different yeah. countries there. Yep. The winters must be just a dramatic change from their life beforehand and your life beforehand. Yes, yes, yes. You know, it's it's a very, very, very new, very different too, but at the same time, you know. <laughs> um, and from my perspective, you know, in the beginning, I struggle because it doesn't matter how many gloves you have, how many hats, you always feel very cold. Right. Exactly. And in the beginning, no car here in this, you know, I was working in the schools, but at the same time, sometimes I work, I walk to work or, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a very different culture. It's a very different atmosphere when winter hits. But now over time, we get used to it. And, um, you know, now I feel like I am I am I'm a Vermonter. I love the winter. I don't do winter sports, but at the same time, I, I, I love it. I love it here. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you this, you know, as part of my work, I used to travel a lot, you know, to go to conferences, do presentation about family engagement and stuff. You know, I went to very different, different cities and state in the, in the nation. But I, for some reason, I can no longer stay somewhere more than three days anymore, because I feel that I'm, 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 um, there is no quality of life elsewhere other than the city of Burlington, the state of Vermont. Yeah. Well, I understand that love affair. I have the same one. It's a wonderful city <laughs> and a wonderful state. Yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, Ali, you're a lawyer by trade then. Yes, yes, by training. Yes, I am. Yes. A, I'm a lawyer, but um, never thought of because also, I mean, what I wanted to do for 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 my study was to do sociology, mm. the science of the society and how people think and group of people exactly. That's what that has always been my interest. Right. Yep. What brought me to law is just I had two options because my baccalaureate, my high school diploma was about in, um, or in uh, literature, literature okay. French literature, right? Um, but I had those two options, English or, uh, or law, because you know, sociology was not offered in my home country back then. And um, you know, I decided to go to law and uh, basically the first two years it's general law. And then after the first two years you do private law or you do public international. The op options also were very, very limited, you know, but I had to just do it. But at the same time, you know, as a college student, um, I was not an amazing, perfect college student because at the same time I was working and teaching here and there, um, but I just do the basic to pass, basically, no. yes. No. Um, and uh, here I am and doing social work and which I feel like is my vocation, is my calling. Yeah. 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 Now, um, having been a city councilor myself a, a long time ago, yeah. what, what, was, what was that moment or 
when you said, I want to run for office in Burlington? What was that like for you and, and what it's been like as a city councilor now? Mm, yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes life has its own um, plan for you. Yep. You just have to follow it. Yep. It has never crossed my mind that I will become, that I will study law. It has never crossed my mind that I will one day, you know, become an elected official, mm -hmm. you know, but all I wanted is to just serve the people, serve the community, right? And I'm going to explain how I became a city councilor. Yep. Yep. So working here in the schools, I was also, when I became AmeriCorps member, AmeriCorps basically, right? And yep. uh, my service to JJ Flynn Elementary School, um, as AmeriCorps member, basically you, 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 you gain a lot of trainings, you know, you understand also the system better, right? About how things function here in the city and in the state of Vermont. And then you meet also a lot of AmeriCorps member and you do service together, right? And through that service, um, it's when I got connected to the community and also, you know, been coming to summits and that's when I started to, you know, get requests from local organization to serve as board members in their, you know, board of directors and um, serve at CVOO and rights and democracy, you know, rights and democracy, yes. Yep. And rights and democracy, actually, I, 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 I was involved in the conception of that organization since the beginning, before even it was created. Wow. Why do we need such an organization that's about civic engagement, about, you know, uh, politics, you know, movement politics, you know, advocacy, et cetera. And until we created that organization, I became a board member and we were providing a lot of trainings about, you know, people who are interested in public office, right? Mm -hmm. And I used to attend to those, never crossed my mind that I will one day be interested in running for something. Um, but one day, you know, a board seat opened right here in Ward 7, where I live, right here, um, because Tom Ayers, uh, city council, had to move on. And, uh, you know, a couple of people such as Shay Tatum, you know, oh, Isaac, wow. you know, those people contacted me and uh, brought me to a coffee shop and gave me a lot of espressos to just say, we got to ask you <laughs> something. <laughs> Drink a lot of espressos and then we have an offer for you. I'm like, okay. So it was April, they, uh, no, February vacation. I remember my family was not here. They were in North Carolina. And they're like, okay, there is this board, um, this city council seat open, and it's right where you live. And we feel like you have the profile, you have the charisma, you have the love of the community. And we think that you need to basically put your name forward to run for office. Wow. Uh -huh. hmm. This is a big uh, ask, but you know, I will need to think about this. You know, just talk to my family and see. And um, you know, a couple of weeks after I reach what back, you know, to just let them know, let's try it. Explain to me how it works. I like, okay, you just be a candidate. Start to think about what do you want to achieve? What are the issues important to you, right? And the rest, we will build a team behind you help you with advertising, with raising money, to help you with a platform, website, and all of it. And that's how things started in, um, in June 27, 2017, mm -hmm. right? About, um, you know, that's when I was elected in a special election uh, with 62% of the votes and okay. against some great, yeah. wonderful people. So since then, I mean, in 2008, I ran again as for my full term, you know, and uh, again, won. And basically, once you, add, once you are in and you understand the process, you understand how, if government is definitely working for the people, what is missing? Um, and the perspective that I was bringing as a new American, someone who was not born and raised here, someone with accent, um, and also the perspective of the people that I, you know, that have the same profile as me, like refugees and immigrants that I worked with. So they needed a voice, uh, the voice uh, of the voiceless, basically. So, and, um, you know, since then, and uh, it's just a learning journey. And um, I now have, 
the, the love of, of, of public service and that capacity. And uh, yeah, it's not easy. And at the same time, it is rewarding, very rewarding. Yes, I would agree on both of those counts. It's not easy. Most people don't understand the amount of time it takes to do the job. <laughs> Those those uh, midnight meetings, Ali. Oh my God! Yes, 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 yes. I'm glad. Yeah, you 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 are a city councilor. You're right. You know. I understand. You know. Yeah. Nice. So, Ali, I'm going to change directions a little bit here. What does family mean to you? Um. Yes. So, from my perspective, family is basically um, is a is a base of somebody's, um, somebody's life and health and well-being, right? You know, it's, 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 a, it's a place of comfort. It's the place of, um, you know, mutual support. Um, it's a place of just, you know, seeing it, seeing it change, seeing it, you know, get bigger or sometimes smaller. Um, it's basically home. It's like the, the, it's like the base of a human being. Each person should have a family or loved ones. Basically, it's uh, it's uh, that's that's what it means to me. I mean, without the family and uh, a person is not is not a whole. Yeah, right. And so for some people who do not have like the typical family, father, mother, or two fathers, or two mothers and children and grandfather, you know, they should also have like people that they call family, people that they can count on. It doesn't matter what you know, successes or challenges in life. I mean, I feel like those are the first responders, the first support system that a person could have in order to uh, feel that they 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 whole and they they alive, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone yeah. that that sense yeah. of um, unconditional love. That exactly. Love. Exactly. Exactly. And it doesn't matter how it is and a family member, I mean, you just love them. You have you know, it doesn't matter what type of person they are, mm. you know, they're just part of you. You cannot change. Or, uh, yeah. Now, when you're, when you were with your grandfather, um, what was that like for, it was, you know, you were the oldest son and here you are with the, your father's father, yeah. uh, which probably meant a lot for your father to have you with his father. Yes. Yes. What did that? Yes. Mean? Yep. Um, yes. It meant that um, you get wiser if you are raised by someone with a lot of knowledge and expertise in life, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know. But he has a military background. Basically, he was also a little bit rough and tough, and have a lot of expectation, right? And one of his expectation was all about the religion, and also the res respect to elderly and people who are just older. Right, than you. So my grandfather also had like a, a, a unique uh, position in the community, you know, because of his, uh, you know, leadership that he exerts as a military person. Um, he also like was like seen as like the court in the neighborhood. For wow. example, if my animals ate your plants, for example, there is conflict between residents. And yep, neighbors, and they always come to him, right? And under the tree, he will sit down, people will sit down, and I'll always sit next to him to hear, to see him deliberate, basically. Wow. You know, giving them the gavel to speak, giving them this gavel, okay, we think, you know, people never bring stuff to the legal department of the of the of the city or the state. You know, they always come to him, you know, about those uh -huh. those issues. You know, and I think like that helped me a lot to to understand, you know conflict resolution like mm -hmm. also um, respect of our family that people have in the in the community as well you know but also as he as he was you know getting older also he became very sick and to tell you the truth there has been time when i did not go to school for example but no one also was there to um to, to remind me, okay, go to school, what are you doing? So basically uh -huh. I grow up just by myself because after he was not paying attention about, you know, yep. but at the same time, um, if I am who I am today, most of the time, I cannot say it's my father, but it's mostly my grandfather, you know, mm -hmm. and the family, you know, his house, my grandfather's house, I was not only the only child too, I had a lot of cousins, uh -huh. my yep. father's brother, you know, we all live in, in, in under his roof. 
um, a very respected and admired, you know, person. And uh, he he basically provided a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot for me that I cannot even count Amazing. on when your father and mother was not there. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. A, a unique, a neat, unique slice of life that you live there. What a what a treasure yes. experience. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, I think all of all of that experience also helped me to be like a very resilient person. You know, um, and also at a very young age, I understood that I, you know, needed to 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 succeed. You know, and it's not my father or my grandmother that would give it, give it to me, but it's just me just understanding basically the life of how how things can be rough, and especially for someone who had it all in the beginning and then yeah. lost it all. So I know what lived experiences, what what being you know uh, wealthy for yep. the lack of a better word, and also lived experience of someone who, you know, is poor, for example. Yes. You know, I remember, um, you know, growing up, for example, there was time where, you know, breakfast was not part of my, my daily routine. You know, I just wake up and um, sometimes just go to school like that, no problem, because wow. I didn't have it. Um, but lunch, yes, I would have lunch, dinner, most of the time, no, one, eat one, one, one meal, a day, yeah. right, basically. And when you become also a teenager, I started to work when vacation, during vacation, uh, to do some mercenaries, people who, you know, I started at a very, very early age to just try to survive and, uh, you know, medical uh, medical attention sometime when I needed it, it was not there, um, or closing to go to school or, you know, school supplies, all of it. I had at a very young age to, 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 to fight for it, to fight for everything. Wow. Else. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, all good, all good. And you know, good story sometimes that I tell to my children that, you know, you, you have it all and you guys have, you know, a, a roof, a father, a mother with you, but growing up, I did not have it. So we expect you now to do excellent, to do well. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about your children. Yeah, so two daughters and uh, both of them, um, you know, the oldest is 14 now born in 2008 and the youngest is eight and both of them girls beautiful you know very respectful and I work very hard my wife and I to teach them about my culture as well and from time to time we go back you know to Africa so they can know where I'm from you know um, and um, you know they also doing extremely well in school for example the oldest is already reading at a like let's say college level you know, wow. Yeah, they love math. And uh, at a very early age, too, we decided as a family to not even have a television in our home, for mm -hmm. example, right? Mm -hmm. So they can focus on just loving books and, um, you know, not seeing bad stuff online. Wow. Um, but now as they grow, and still, we still do not have a cable at home in our home. We just rely on CCTV, Channel 17, and, you know, social media to read about what's happening, Seven Days, VT Digger, and CNN apps here and there. Yep. Um, but I feel like, yeah, my kids are also very active people, very active children, uh, very respectful. And uh, the oldest was named after my mother, Absa. Right? And the youngest was named after my, you know, my superhero's uh, mother, Mam Aisatu, Mam Aisatu Samba. Yeah. And actually, is today is the anniversary of um, the death of Mam Aisatu. Mam Aisatu is like my hero's mother, an amazing, wonderful woman. I'll send you her picture. And today is actually her anniversary of her uh -huh. death. Yeah. She's in Senegal. So uh, tell me more about superheroes and what that what that means for you. This yeah. is a real person. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the basically, you know, when you when you are with no mother, no father, and basically you being raised by the community, you know, yeah. you could at least maybe take the wrong turn yeah. and become something really very negative and end up in, you know. It's a judicial system and all of it, right? Yep. But in one point in my life, my father's brother, Abdurrahman, he was not living with us at that time. As a child, I remember him coming one day and talking to us about 
someone named El Haji Modungam, Modungam, right? A spiritual person um, that I have never met. And he um, reside in Senegal, right? A person who used to be also very rich, but a person who loved the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Pay, uh, peace upon him, right? All of the life of Muhammad Ngam is the love of the Prophet Muhammad. He, yeah. he that's what he preaches. That's what he asks the people to pay attention to Allah, God, yeah, and also for people to uh, remember that living a life is not only about you know uh, breathing, right eating, drinking, sleeping, waking up, being happy, being unhappy. But also there is what we call faith is in each and every single one of us. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, that faith is dead because people pay attention to, you know, uh, all the things, materialistic things. Right. Right? And most of the time they forget about their faith, what's inside. Mm -hmm. And it should be at the same importance as eating and drinking. It, it has to also be nurtured, right? And the way to nurture it is to understand, you know, the Quran, like the, the, yep. the, yeah, the Quran, and also to understand the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So Allah Jumu I never met him, like right here in person. I never, never met him. But um, he's teaching basically through my father's brother, Right, uh, definitely started to, and I was teenager back then, like a teen, like in 1990, let's say 74, 1995, 1996. That's when I started to basically pay attention and, you know, started to pay attention also to my faith, to the religion of Islam, and also to, you know, be moral, to, to stay, to do what's good and leave what's bad, you know. And um, that definitely changed my life around, you know, mm -hmm. it gave me like purpose of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of service, a purpose of, of taking care of others, not only myself, mm -hmm. right? And that's how everything started, you know, from working with the Peace Corps volunteers to coming to the US to yeah. serving my community, becoming yeah. a city council, all of it came through al Haji Muhammad Musa Fango, you know, and, um, yeah, and my, when I had a daughter, I named my second daughter after uh, the mother of Aladdin Morgan. Okay, that's a, wow, what a, an amazing story. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're opening your faith deepened you. Yeah, to be have a, a purpose in life and knowing and, what that well, yeah. exactly, wow. exactly. And if it was not this teaching of of Aladdin Morgan, I will have maybe all the priorities. You know, um, and in one point, basically as a teenager, you know, my group of friends, we were talking about, hey, one of us need to find a girl and have a baby. For example, we don't, we're not even thinking because all the kids in the neighborhood in our age was having right. like children here and there. Exactly. Um, but we definitely, uh, you know, wow. yeah, that definitely may give me like the, the right turn and yes. to find purpose. And to, that, that's yeah. your uncle that opened you up to that. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. here, being here, um, is there a mosque that you're active in? Yes. Yes. There is one. Um, actually, here in Shitindan County, we have two mosques. The Somalian people have their own mosque in Minuski, and also the Islamic Society have a mosque in South Burlington. Right, um, but I mean, I do not go to the mosques a lot because of maybe distance, and also here you have requirements such as your job requirements. That right. Muslims, we have to pray five times a day. Right, right. But Fridays, most of the time, around one or two p.m. Sometimes I go to the mosque in South Burlington. Right, mm -hmm. uh, but in my family, basically, we do our prayers here. Right. We just resume the month of Ramadan, 30 days of fasting right. from sunset to sundown. And at the end of the uh, Ramadan, we did also a celebration. Right. And we all went to the mosque and uh, we prayed. And also, you know, in the evening, we we and all the people from West Africa, we came together and had a good meal. We celebrated together as well. Yes. Yes. And, uh, yes, and you know, all everything that I know about the Quran, I also try to 
teach it to my children. You know, just me and um, yeah. So. Wow, that's great, Ali. What a good life, a good man. Yeah, we 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 trying, but not as interesting as your life, and you know all of it. And <laughs> so, um, I'm thinking of it like a wisdom. If you had wisdom to share from your own life to other people, what are some of those those points that you would make? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think the most important one would be um, for people to, you know, whatever they believe in, right? Um, you know, because this life is 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 going to end in one way or the other, sooner no. or later, for each and every single one of us. No. People need to remember people that they used to love. Where are those people now? It doesn't matter what they have achieved or did not achieve what they left behind or did not leave behind, right? They are gone, mm -hmm. right? And for each and every single one of us to think about that, that this life, you should not strive for doing things that are bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't do it for your, to yourself, don't do it to others. You know, know that it's gonna end, whatever it is, it's happiness or, you know, sadness, it will end, right? Yep. For people to keep on focusing on, you know, um, there may be an afterlife if you believe in God, right? Um, and also for people to keep their dignity, you know, anything should not push you to do something, you know, that you may regret or that will stay in the name of your family once you got, right? I think people also need to think about that, you know, basically um, the purpose of every single one of us is to serve yourself, yes, but also to serve others, to serve other people, right? Whatever you have, give for those who do not have much, right? Um, and be compassionate, especially for your neighbors. And uh, because anything happened to you before your family members across the country, all the world come to you. The people that live behind you are human beings. You have to respect them and know their worth and also support them where they are They are in need, you know? Yeah, family, community, your city, and then the world, you know? Everything that you do also started in your own home, right? Started in your neighborhood, started in your city, and, you know, spread it out. And the power of your love can change actually the world. And mm -hmm. do not underestimate anything good deed that you do, do not underestimate it, mm -hmm. basically, you know? Do not think this is too small and it can be small, but it, it can be also very rewarding. Life is good. Life is good. Let's just um, keep on striving for the betterness of every single one of us. Let's also respect and appreciate the other. It doesn't okay. matter, you know, um, he's, her, you accept them, acceptance of the people, of the person they have worth and uh, they need to be respected and celebrated. Yeah. Wonderful word. Thank you. Is there, so we're getting close to the end of our interview. Is there something you'd like to share that we haven't touched on at this point about your life? Um, yeah, I mean, I want, um, what, I, what I want is basically, you know, uh, my, the purpose of my life also could, could be, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out too. I mean, I am in my, 40s, right? Um, early 40. And um, I feel like, you know, what I have experienced, where I came from, the quality of life that I have seen there, right? Every time that I go back and visit what I see, right? And where I live now, what I experience and what I see are completely two different worlds. That's people, true. yes, definitely people are suffering in, in, in Africa. You know, what I experienced as a kid, many people are experiencing and even worse right now, right? And here, being here, seeing the, you know, the quality of life, basically, um, you know, the quality of the education system, the health system, you know, um, I want to find a way to basically build a bridge. Yeah. Like between how, and especially just how do we support children, the well-being of children and families, like from, for the most vulnerable of where I come from, 
you know. Okay. But most of the time, you're also too busy about this work, about this community, about, you know, your family, your work and all of it, that sometimes I, I forget. But I think that's my, my, my ultimate dream, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to build that bridge, to be able to maybe, you know, open the eyes of children that are here that actually, you know, uh, you right. have to be thankful. And um, how do I make that bridge is something that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm thinking thinking of. Mm -hmm. And one day, why not build a school there uh, and teach people about sustainability, basically what I have learned here in the state of Vermont, um, to take care of themselves, take care of their environment um, and uh, their beliefs and, and, and all of that. Basically bring, uh, uh, plant the seed of hope. In yes. the, the next generation of uh, Senegalese and Mauritanians. Yeah, and I, I think there's a there's a, a reciprocal thing here that if uh, what you do in Senegal could have benefits to people here, yeah. that might not appreciate and understand what's going on over there. Yeah, yeah. I've, so my old city council had on here for a second. Have you ever thought about creating a sister city relationship between Burlington and? A community over in Senegal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought about it. I definitely thought about it. And I believe that, you know, in even me and the mayor of Burlington, you know, Weinberger, we kind of talked about it. We're like, okay, let's make it a goal in 2021. And I feel like after COVID came, you uh -huh. know, it will be very hard. But I think it's now about the right time to, at least over the next couple of two years, to see how do we make it make that happen, and uh, yeah. I also started to already make those connections about there is a sister city commission in the city of Burlington that I need to approach and rebring this 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 issue. I yeah. think it will be very powerful as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And also, as you know, you know, Senegal and 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 the state of Vermont, they already have a cooperation in military cooperation. Mm. Yeah, they already it already exists. Military Senegalese military has come here. Uh, military national guard go to Senegal, you know. Oh, and I remember the president sometimes comes here. You know, I feel like it will be an easy to yeah. make it. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So that's, yeah. okay. So it sounds like you're on it. Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. yes. You just reminded me, but actually, <laughs> in one point I was on it, and then it went down. Yeah, and, you right. know, all of it. Um, wonderful. Um, yes. Wow. All right. Well, Ali, this has been a wonderful time together and interview, and I so appreciate all that you are and what you're doing for our community. Yeah. And, um, and thank you for spending some time with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gary, for doing this and uh, for your technical person too behind the scene. Thank you for, Absolutely. for this.